and welcome to this uh, annotated workshop that's um, being delivered in conjunction with the Online Learning Consortium's Accelerate 2021 conference, which has both virtual and face-to-face -face components this year. We've done this workshop a couple of different times now in conjunction with OLC. I really want to thank them for um, making it possible to do this sort of special event that um, invites both OLC attendees, welcome if you're one of those, and uh, outside folks too, who may not also be attending OLC Accelerate uh, to this workshop to talk uh, deeply about um, social annotation. So we've got a, a pretty exciting show here today um, and I'll introduce our guests in just a second. Um, I just wanted to take one minute to explain what we mean by annotate ed. As institutions start to um, get engaged with social annotation um, in a really formal way, uh, they join something that we've been building here at Hypothesis called the Annotated Community, which is, you know, at annotation, social annotation in education. And there are so many institutions participating now that I'm sure you can't even make them out on this slide. Uh, maybe some of the really big letters here, but it's, you know, now over 350 schools. And so we really see this as part of the community that is um, gathered together to kind of think about social annotation and move it forward. And we think about these workshops as being an event where those folks come together and invite others. You don't have to be a member of the annotated community in order to join and participate. We welcome you regardless. Um, but that's uh, a little bit of explanation around um, what uh, annotated is. And you'll see here too that um, these slides uh, are available online. There's a bit.ly link up here in the corner, which I'll share with you um, in the chat as well, in case you wanna actually get to the slides um, yourself. Um, there's links in the slides to, to various resources. Um, not absolutely necessary. We'll be showing them on screen as well. So one thing that I wanted to just uh, briefly point out here is that this is a workshop where you will be asked to actively and actively annotate yourself um, with other folks during this workshop. And so um, this is a page um, <clears throat> that kind of, oops, that explains what that uh, process will look like. We're not going to do it right away. Um, my colleague Jeremy Dean is going to kind of get us all on the same page about social annotation and what it is first. But uh, you will need a free hypothesis account in order to participate in the annotation. And so if you don't have one yet, that might be a time to get that set up. And so here's a link to this sort of guide page about how to get involved in an event uh, with, where annotation is happening uh, live. And so I just wanted to make a brief mention of that so that um, people could take a little time to get set up with their accounts in advance if they need to. So that said, um, here's our agenda for today. It's pretty straightforward. We're gonna do two main things. First, as I mentioned, my colleague, Dr. Jeremy Dean. Say hello to the folks, Jeremy. There he is waving at you. <laughs> Hi, folks. And uh, so um, you, I'm sure many of you have seen him before. He's gonna take a few minutes to kind of get us all on the same page about what social annotation is, how we think about it. And we realized that of course, a bunch of you folks who are here already know all about that, but there's also new folks who don't. And so we take that, min you know, just a few minutes to kind of get everybody together in a common understanding about what social annotation is so that then we can move forward to the main event, which is gonna be, um, with our special guest, uh, Dr. Rajiv Janjiani, who will be here in just a second. He's popping between events right now and will be tuned in in time after Jeremy finishes his, um, his introduction. Um, and I'm really, uh, I'm really proud to welcome Rajiv today. Uh, and I know he's not here to hear this, um, but um, <clears throat> it will be really great to, uh, to have him uh, as a guest on the show, he's uh, a long time um, deep advocate for uh, social annotation and also open education in general. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that. And part of the reason why Rajiv is here today is that he is delivering the keynote address for the OLC Accelerate Conference virtual session um, next week. And this is a little bit of a kind of um, preview of that in the sense that we're going to be talking about the themes of his keynote and annotating around those on a document that that Rajiv has picked out for us. So that will come up in the second half of the show, even though it's it's much more than, than half of it. 
So um, without further ado, then, I'm going to pass the baton over to my colleague, Dr. Jeremy Dean, who serves as the VP of Education here at Hypothesis. Um, and he is going to take over the, the slide deck um, here. And I just want to um, also uh, give a shout out to Jeremy, who um, many of you may know already, but some of you may not, that he is also a, has been and still is a deep educator in using social annotation. So yeah, people like me and Jeremy have turned our, our attention over to trying to help other people get involved with social annotation. But at his heart, Jeremy is a teacher. And so I, what I, I just want to make sure that folks know that as he uh, kind of helps us understand how he thinks about social annotation as a teacher and as an evangelist. Um, so take it away, Jeremy. All right, folks, I'm going to tell you about something that's going to change your life today. If you sign up today, it's absolutely free. No, um, yes, I'm an educator by heart. I, the subtext there was that Nate and I turned to the dark side of actually working for uh, something that is not physically or definitively within the academy. But um, kudos to, to Nate and Franny, who I believe also are educators at heart, and for this great event. Um, I did want to do a shout out just because they are so hard to see here. Um, to a few institutions that I can see represented by individuals in the chat here. So CSU Pueblo, Colorado State Pueblo, shout out. Kenyon uh, College, shout out. National University of Ireland, Galway, shout out. And Raritan Community College, shout out. I'm sure there's others, but that's what I could pick up from, from some familiar names in the chat. Um, it, it is true, without our partners in the annotated community, none of this happens. So thanks to those of you that are instructors that have advocated for hypothesis and technologists that have advocated for hypothesis and are supporting hypothesis through, through your institutions. Um, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing today without that. Um, as Nate mentioned, uh, I am an educator by heart. Uh, I became a high school and a teacher right out of high school, uh, college rather, um, and then when I got a graduate degree and during getting my graduate degree, I taught um, composition and literature for many years at the University of Texas. Um, and I think it was back when I was teaching high school that I got in the habit of handing out this poem uh, to my to my students on day one of, of their courses, because before any kind of computers and teaching came into my practice, um, annotation was always part of it. Uh, it was part of my own practice as a student, my practice as a scholar, my practice as an educator. And uh, not that I'd read a bunch of research articles on it, but fundamentally, I believe that it was going to be critical to the success of my students in my courses that they write in the margins of their books. So I tried to inspire them on day one with this poem by Billy Collins. We've all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen, if only to show we did not just laze in an armchair turning pages. We pressed the thought into the wayside, planted an impression along the verge. This is what I hoped my students would do outside of class. And this is what I believed would be useful for my students to be successful in the course, to uh, better understand reading, uh, if we did reading quizzes when I taught high school, uh, to better begin to comprehend and analyze uh, what we were reading and studying uh, when we wrote papers. Um, I and of course, there's nothing radical <laughs> about this proposition, right? I didn't invent this idea. Annotation is probably the oldest piece of education technology uh, that we have practiced for centuries. You know, Nate mentioned the kind of chat in a webinar is a kind of annotation, probably cave paintings our kind of annotation. So annotation has always been around, and especially since the, uh, the advent of the book, it's something that students and scholars and everyday readers have done to be more active and critical in their reading, to better understand what they're reading, um, and to begin to formulate their own thoughts about their reading, which of course becomes their own writing. Um, in the previous session that we just had for Liquid Margins, we were talking about the teaching of writing, and it's, you know, I'm sure the scholarship is out there and people are talking about this, but it's so clear that writing begins with reading <laughs> and reading the, the sort of writing part of reading is, is annotations. Um, and so anyway, this has been around for a long time. It's not a radical proposition, um, but we do face some challenges when we start to read uh, more online or even when we read an analog format in a digital era. Uh, era. And I think um, I got interested in social annotation when I was in grad school and exploring digital pedagogies. Um, and I came across this quote, it's now nine years old, an article from the Chronicle of Higher Ed that I think still really captures for me the power of uh, social digital annotation with tools like Hypothesis. Online, a book can be a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. 
Uh, and you can see here both the idea that readers are sort of taking notes, they're making traces on a page that help them uh, through their reading. Um, but what's really powerful about social annotation is obviously sharing those notes, sharing those pathways uh, of thought. And I just became so excited about that uh, in grad school uh, for English. And I basically jumped the academic ship and was like, I really want to bring social annotation to classrooms. That's what I've been doing for the past uh, nine years. Um, so this is our vision of annotation uh, at Hypothesis, um, that any website, article, ebook, document, or piece of uh, multimedia can have multiple layers of annotation. Uh, a private layer of marginal notes, like Lily Collins is talking about, that's just your notes. You know, you're taking notes on, on, on online reading, for example. They don't, you don't always have the ability to take anno make annotations when you read digitally. So this is a tool that allows you to do that. Um, these notes and, and comments can also be public, right? There's a public layer. I think that's the layer that we're going to be working in today um, when we read uh, and, and annotate with Rajiv. Um, there's a public layer for this. Uh, annotation practice. This is a really neat thing, actually, for those of us that are educators and have been telling students to annotate forever, that now there's a tool that allows you to annotate the web, um, that exploring the web, which, of course, everybody does every day, can now involve a, 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 a practice called annotation that's normally been relegated to, like, the nerdiest of nerdy English uh, instructors trying to get their stu uh, students to read more critically and deeply. Now it's out there. It's part of common, you know, digital uh, internet practice. Um, but for educators, the most important part of what Hypothesis is building are the private groups um, that you can create with Hypothesis um, that allow you to annotate with colleagues uh, that you might be teaching with or exploring uh, scholarship with um, and with courses that you teach. Um, so private reading annotating groups uh, for courses. Um, so quickly. I'll just say uh, practically what Hypothesis does. Some of you guys will be doing this in just a second. Um, it's a simple tool, very simple tool. We were just in this last section, and one of the instructors like, super easy and intuitive for both instructors and students to use. Um, you select text to annotate. You highlight something on a, on a digital document, and you can create an annotation. Uh, you can reply uh, to existing annotations and have conversations, and we'll be doing that, I hope, a lot today on the text that we'll be reading and annotating with Rajiv. Welcome, Rajiv. Good to see you. Um, and you can annotate together in groups. I think today we'll be annotating as a public group, but if we wanted to have a more private conversation, we could create a private group and have that smaller uh, cohort for reading and discussion. Um, just a quick shout out, because so many of you guys are coming from an educational context. We do have an integration with learning management systems that makes it a lot easier for students and instructors to get started uh, with the tool. You don't need to create accounts. You don't need to create private groups. All of that is done uh, for you with LMS integration. Um, and it basically just allows you to add a layer of annotation on top of uh, readings that you are, um, that you're uh, having students read already. And that's one thing I like to point out is that this isn't something that it could radically transform the way that you teach, but it's not going to require you to radically transform your course because you're simply adding a very simple functionality on top of reading that you've already assigned. Um, I'm going to share three top-level takeaways uh, that we've learned from instructors and students um, as, uh, as we've gone on this journey with them around the, the value of social annotation for teaching and learning. Um, the first goes back to that nothing new aspect of annotation, that it makes reading active. Um, you know, active learning is kind of almost a given these days that we want our students to be active learners, not just passive recipients of knowledge. We want them to be more creative and engaged in different ways. While in the context of reading, tools like Hypothesis help students become more active reading, which of course is a gateway to all other kinds, a lot of other kinds of activity and creativity um, for students. Although I will just say one neat thing about annotation that, that slide always reminds me of is how students can be active, um, how they can share their experience or show their expertise um, through annotation um, is uh, expanded through multimedia, um, multimodal potential of uh, hypothesis annotation. You can see here that students are actually annotating a poem with memes, or that, that wasn't just memes. I think the assignment was annotate with an image, and some students were using memes. Um, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this with the, in the previous session um, where we were talking about the teaching of, of reading and writing with social annotation. But I think it's very interesting to think about how students 
think with images or can think with images or share their ideas or their experience with images and video or simply hyperlinks, making connections between other texts. And that those are important and valuable forms of both affective and cognitive reading that are important for uh, students to cultivate and instructors to take note of. Um, so hypothesis makes reading active. Hypothesis makes reading visible, I really think is, is a sort of radically new and powerful thing about social annotation. When I handed out that Billy Collins poem in my classes, um, I, I didn't do much besides that. I didn't check that my students had annotated and tell them how to annotate. I didn't necessarily talk to them about how to take their annotations and do something else with it. Um, how to use annotations to study for a test or a quiz, how to use annotations as the, uh, the material for the beginning of a paper. Um, I just assumed that it was good for them and they were going to do it and then they would uh, um, and perform better on those summative assignments. But being able to actually see how students are encountering a text, certainly being able to see that students have encountered the text. I mean, I know uh, it might be controversial to say this, but, you know, some instructors have told us, I guess, seems like my students aren't always doing the reading. This is a way to kind of force them to do some of the reading, to share some of their ideas. There's other ways to nurture a, 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 a culture in your course where students are completing those assignments. But certainly, you can see that students have done the reading. I think more importantly, though, you can see where they were confused, um, where they were spot inspired. And you can intervene and join them in those inspirations as the instructor based on that visual evidence of how they've encountered the text. You can see maybe that Rajiv is not paying enough attention to the textual evidence um, and needs to like really draw more on the author's words in his uh, statement of claims. Um, so uh, just a little jab there for you to uh, Rajiv. Um, so that, that visible piece I think is incredibly powerful for, um, for instructors and for students. And the other thing we hear is, and this goes into the next point, is that it's not just that the instructor can see what the students are doing, but the students see each other. And there's tremendous value in the student seeing how other people encounter a text, how other people might be interpreting something that they have a better understanding of, how different people might be interpreting the same thing in different ways. Um, I, uh, 24 hours ago, I was thinking about the social as a kind of benefit in and of itself, that, you know, it's good to have tools that are social and engage students and they're with their colleagues and building community. And I think that's all true. But I read an article last night, again, this is referring back to the previous session that we just did, that made me think that social is a critical piece in terms of developing fundamental and higher order academic skills. Seeing how other people are interpreting something helps you become a better interpreter of stuff. Um, and so I think that social has uh, all kinds of, and there's a great line in the previous session where the, the, the one of the uh, participants was talking about a lot of times when a student might encounter a text um, in isolation, and they encounter difficult, complex, uh, you know, language. Uh, they might get, they might start to feel isolated. They might start to feel alone um, and not understand that everybody's struggling with this, right? When I read Derrida in college, right? I, I mean, in grad school, I probably was like, I, you know, should drop out. I don't know what this guy's saying, but that's the point. Everybody's struggling in that way, and seeing that other people are struggling, I think, can help you feel. Um, more comfortable. That's part of that. There's others engaged in the struggle. That might be what the definition of uh, the academy is: is struggling with other ideas and, and working through them. Um, and seeing that other people are doing that, that your classmates are also struggling, um, helps you, I think, find a home and be more comfortable um, in a text and push through and, and finish that reading and ask the questions and uh, and and and, uh, and better comprehend and begin to think uh, for yourself. Um, Nate, I think. If you could just remind me on time where I'm at, I think I'm supposed to be wrapping it up soon. Yeah, you're good. You've got a couple more minutes. Uh, we wanted to give time for Rajiv to make it here, and he has done that, so that's great. Um, you've got a couple more minutes. Why don't you take it, uh, you know, just before uh, 1030, and we'll shift over then. Perfect. All right, then I'm going to just finish out with these final uh, five slides to give you just some more thinking around, um, you know, again, my focus is how to use this tool in the classroom. Um, and then work with instructors, learn from instructors, and help instructors leverage the power of social annotation uh, in teaching and learning. Um, so I'll just share uh, five final slides that point in the right direction. As Nate said, I know a lot of the folks here are veterans of, uh, of social annotation. So this is all old hats. So would you say old hats, old tricks? I don't know. You've, you're familiar with this material. 
Um, but for those that are new, maybe it will be helpful for you in thinking about how you could turn around and use uh, a tool like Hypothesis in the classroom. Um, the first is, uh, the first sort of, you know, uh, way to use Hypothesis is just a reminder that it's not just about reading. I sort of emphasized this before, but that a lot of instructors that use Hypothesis in the classroom um, aren't necessarily raving about, you know, their students becoming uh, more expert readers or developing reading skills with the tool. They really rave about the way it brought a class together, uh, the way it built community in a class, and the way it primed students for collaboration, not just on top of text with the tool of uh, hypothesis, but in other ways that they were being asked to collaborate in the class, how they might converse in class discussion, how they might work together on other projects, uh, group projects. Of course, this idea of hypothesis building and maintaining community over the past 18 months has taken on a new valence. Um, certainly we've had a lot of instructors and students say they were, you know, thankful for hypothesis as a way to kind of anchor their experience as students and instructors when um, physical classrooms were no longer uh, the sort of epicenter for that kind of centering of community. Um, one great way to start with hypothesis is to have student, students annotate the syllabus. Um, it's a great way to get used to the tool both uh, for, for uh, students, um, but also a great way to kind of reflect on the syllabus uh, as a community and say, well, have some of these readings been done before. Uh, maybe we can skip them in, in, this, in this course and bring in something different. Uh, you can get feedback from your students. It kind of creates a horizontality where you're no longer, you know, telling them this is what we're doing, but you get some feedback from them. Um, can ask them things like, you know, uh, what are you most excited about? What are you most worried about in the syllabus and get to know where they're coming from a little bit more? Um, certainly you can just turn this tool on, uh, on top of your readings and, um, you know, re resurrect the margins, if you will, uh, in the digital context, because a lot of times, you know, that note taking ability is not available. Um, but I think the more deliberate and directed that, um, annotation assignments with hypothesis are, the more you and your students will get out of them. Um, certainly it's a tool that can be used to model annotation or to kind of take the discussion form from some separate tab um, and back on top of the reading. Obviously, as an English instructor, I always want um, students to stay close to the reading. So this is a way to anchor discussion threads and discussion forms within the reading um, where an instructor might go through and pre-feed a text with questions that students would answer in line or to model annotation. Um, but certainly, I think the most powerful use of the tool is in a more seminar style discussion online, sort of asynchronous seminar style uh, discussion where um, students are leading the way, students are the ones asking the questions, um, and they're working collaboratively through uh, a text. And with that, I think I am perhaps timing myself to be done and hand it back over to Nate. And Rajiv. That's great, Jeremy. Thank you so much. And I, I love what uh, Rajiv just said in the text, like, come for the Dante, stay for the Homer. And I admit <laughs> that I'm in the middle of rereading the Odyssey right now because there's a, a really exciting new translation out by a, a female translator, which has been really uh, interesting to read. And I highly recommend at least the introduction to that translation, uh, just to, as a that would be such a great text for a, a literature class to explore together, the introduction, not the poem. At any rate, I mean, you can explore the poem too, but haven't we all read Homer enough? But I am going to flip back to sharing my screen um, just to actually formally welcome uh, Rajiv here to the stage. Um, Dr. Rajiv Janjiani is, um, you know, leads teaching and learning uh, at Kwantlen uh, Polytechnic University in um, British Columbia. I believe I have that correct, and um, <laughs> and uh, works with a, just a ton of really um, great and talented people up there that he uh, is probably honored to collaborate with, I'm sure. And I just wanted to thank him uh, for taking the time out from a really busy schedule and his preparations for his keynote at OLC Accelerate to take part in this workshop. He's really given a lot of a lot of time and effort to it. And so I thought I'd start out just by checking in with you, Rajiv, and asking how you're doing today and, and welcome you to this space and see if you have anything introductory that you'd like to say before we actually dive into the workshop activity. 
Thank you very much, Nate and, and Jeremy and Franny. Good to see you all. I uh, really appreciate the invitation to be here. I do want to acknowledge that I'm joining you from my home, which is on the traditional ancestral territories of the Squamish nation. Um, and I'm really excited to, to I'm looking ahead to, to Monday and, and where we're going to go with that with that keynote. But um, I think you're right. I, incredibly lucky to, to work with the, the people I do and, and even within my institution, of course, staggeringly gifted and passionate people. Um, and a lot of this has to do with, you know, where we are going as a teaching institution that values open access. Um, but also I see, you know, incredible colleagues like uh, Brenna Clark Ray uh, from the broader BC community here. Um, I will also just quickly want to say that, you know, I've worked with Hypothesis for so many years now. And, and so um, uh, one of the things I always appreciate is, is just how, how, uh, how wonderful Hypothesis is as a citizen uh, in the edtech space, especially modeling um, how edtech can be ethical. And so I just want to uh, uh, just note that and appreciate that and give you a shout out. Your support for, for example, Ian, Ian Linkletter has been noticed and appreciated, uh, and, and certainly the way in which you approach um, technology with a mind to uh, privacy and agency is, is certainly, I think, a model. So I'm uh, glad to be with you all. Well, thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Rajiv. That was a really nice thing to say. And uh, we appreciate that. We, I know that Jeremy and I especially spend a lot of time thinking about how ed tech vendors act and see if we can't act in a different way than a lot of them do. And so that's really important to our work. So, so thank you. We are going to be diving into some hands-on annotation here. Um, and uh, I'm going to share a link to this uh, slide that's up there now. Well, it's not a slide, the web page behind this slide actually. Um, because you will need a hypothesis account in order to participate in the hands-on act annotation activity. So I just want to give folks a little bit of a chance to go set one up if they don't have one already. Um, they're free and easy to set up. It only takes like a minute. So um, you can do that in the background while we're while we're talking. And so I, I wanted to shift now to um, you know kind of why we're gathered here today. And so um, unless you've changed it um, without me knowing in the night, Rajiv, I believe that the title of your keynote that's coming up next week is 2021 at Pedagogical Odysseys. So um, I think that's that's a it's a really um, it's a great uh, a great way to go back to your um, come for the Dante stay for the Homer <laughs> remark, which is is so great. Um, like I said, I'm in the middle of rereading it now, and I'm telling you, boy, I didn't realize that you could actually sail your boat to Hades. Um, but I, I think that all of us have maybe sailed our boats to Hades and and then some in this past in this past time. And so that's something that we'll be thinking about uh, as we as we talk today. So I apologize for the title. I'm, I'm certainly not the best when it comes to, to writing titles for, for my talks. But over here, I, I think I will be referring to certainly the Homerian Odyssey, for sure. Uh, certainly in terms of so much of what we do is, uh, you know, I suppose you could say connected with being inspired by the by the goddess of wisdom. But, you know, if 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 we're talking about academia, it certainly makes sense to look at a, you know the journey between Troy and Ithaca. It really should have taken two weeks, and it ended up taking two years. And if that is an acad uh, academia, I don't know what is. Uh, but of course, I'm also talking about um, the space odyssey, and part of this is um, you know our naive assumptions about the neutrality of artificial intelligence is among the themes on Monday. That makes sense, and of course, I've, I was also thinking of the Joycean Odyssey. <laughs> That's in the background. Shout out to um, Kate Malloy from from uh, an Irish institution who oh, I know is in the crowds. <laughs> um, there's just all sorts of different um, parallels we could probably draw to the different Odysseys. Um, so, and and we'll go on one ourselves. And I did want to preface um, th that what we're about to do a little bit before I ask Rashiv to to expand a little bit more on his on his theme. Uh, for the keynote. And that's that what we're really trying to do here is it's kind of a professional development experience is what we're sort of thinking of this as, right? Is that, you know, we're all educators probably in some, you know, on some level, maybe we, we help educators, maybe we're educators ourselves. Um, and, you know, maybe we uh, have already had some experience with social annotation, but maybe we don't always have the time to actually do a little bit of it ourselves. And so that's what we're going to try to do here today. Rajiv's picked the text for us, again, by his colleague, Jennifer Hardwick Post. Um, and we're going to we're going to dive into that and, and annotate it together. But um, before we start doing that, I thought it might be um, it might be interesting to hear from you, Rajiv, um, why you thought that this particular text would be 
an important one for us to be looking at and thinking about as educators in in connection to this pedagogical odyssey that you're thinking about. Thanks, Nate. I, I think there's a few reasons. One of them is, of course, you know, when you work with people as brilliant as Jen Hardwick, you really desperately want the world to, to, to read their work and learn from them as much as, as you do. And, and um, so that's part of it. But, you know, I think the, what connects this for me is, is reflecting on the, on the epic, yes, but also incredibly traumatic journey of the last 18 months. I think what, what I fear is, even more than the many, many lessons that they've been that that folks have learned, uh, and of course, there've been many different journeys, mind you. Dif institutions are so different, cultures are so different. Um, but my fear is that there are even more lessons that have gone begging, and, and that's part of the the worry for me. And so, uh, you know, I think you can, if you look at what what Jen is sort of pointing to, she's really trying to 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 understand how her values allow her to position herself in a way that that challenges herself challenges institutions challenges norms in higher education to really you know rebuild uh, higher education in a way that foregrounds care self-care um, and certainly you know students uh, first um, and so it, it is something that you know her words her insights her voice is, is very powerful um, and so for me, she's just an incredible inspiration. Um, I encourage you to read some of her other work, including on our blog and elsewhere. Uh, but I think she's asking exactly the, the right kinds of questions. Um, and I'm fortunate to work with her because she helps ensure that I don't miss as many lessons as I would have otherwise. And so I'm hoping that um, we'll be able to uh, kind of dive into that together and draw parallels between not just what you're going to talk about, and what you're thinking about, Rajiv, but connect it out to the web of other experiences that everybody else that's here in this workshop brings to the table. Um, and I think this is can kind of demonstrate some of the things that Jeremy was talking about in the introduction, right, is how uh, reading together can, um, you know, enable us to use the text as a sort of gathering place for kind of an outward, you know, uh, web of different ideas and connections and thoughts and links and so forth. And so I've already tried to demonstrate a little bit of that in the um, in the uh, document itself, which we're just about to turn to, and I'll share my screen in a second so that we can get started. I just wanted to address a couple people are, you know, bringing up questions in the chat. Um, so like Jim asked about <laughs> annotating on mo mobile. So uh, it's definitely a challenge to annotate on mobile. It's possible. But due to the limited screen real estate on a mobile device, it can be really tricky to both be reading and highlighting and annotating at the same time. And so I'm just going to say that you're going to find things going to be a lot easier to do if you can do it on a desktop device. And you can go in and annotate later. You don't have to annotate real time with us now if you don't want to. Um, so Rajiv, before um, we actually tip over to the text itself, um, is there anything else that you wanted to uh, sort of bring up to make sure that we were thinking about um, as we dive in and start reading here and, and writing? I mean, just to say, you know, I think this is just exciting for me because this is where the, the fun lies, right? We often talk about teaching and learning and we focus on, on those as two concepts, but the third concept is the word and. And for me, that's the liminal space. And, and so it's lo, sort of like the margins. It's the it's what connects the two concepts. And so for me, the, the, the reading into the understanding, the enhancement that we're gonna do is gonna be exciting to advance um, and build on, on um, Jen's work. So sort of in the spirit of open education, um, so no, I'm excited to see where we go and, and, and I'm sure, uh, so I, I just encourage you to, to sort of have that conversation and, and build on each other's comments as well. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. Does Jen know that all, all these people are descending on her post today? <laughs> okay. She does, yeah, no, agency, right? So I definitely asked for permission ahead of time. Great. Yeah, and that is, um, <clears throat> that is one of the things that um, is probably wise to do. Um, of course, uh, you know, the way hypothesis works, it doesn't require uh, the post author to, <laughs> to allow annotation, um, which is, we could talk a little bit about that and the ethics of that too. Um, but I think it's a great practice, especially if you're going to, um, you know, uh, have a focus annotation engagement on a text to kind of 
try to bring the author into that conversation. And I know this is a practice a lot of other people do too. In fact, the author can even join in the annotation itself and it be can become a kind of conversation with the author about the text underneath. So um, I'm sharing my screen now and you should be seeing um, Jen's post there. Um, <clears throat> and I just wanted to spend a couple minutes orienting people to to what's on the screen, just kind of the mechanics of it to make sure that we all kind of know what we're looking at here and, and know what we're doing. And so I'm gonna, um, you'll see on the right hand side here that this is the hypothesis annotation sidebar. And I'm gonna close it just for a second and pop it out of the way. And then I'll also note that this eyeball icon in it toggles the annotation, or I'm sorry, the highlighting on the page on and off. You'll see how the yellow is appearing and disappearing. And so just so that you know, one of the basic capabilities here of hypothesis is that if you kind of want to clean read and you want to read without being distracted by the highlighting and the annotation, you can kind of shut the, shut the sidebar down and turn off the highlighting and just have a clean read. And so maybe you want to go through something uh, you know, yourself one time and read it without all that distraction, or maybe you do want it open. Um, so both of those are available to you. And here's another little secret that a lot of folks don't know about the sidebar. If you grab the little, uh, you know, um, greater than carrot handle at the top, you can make it wider and narrower. Um, <laughs> and so this is a handy little thing because sometimes the sidebar interferes with the actually being able to read the text. And so you can kind of have them both open at the same time and make that sidebar um, wider and narrower. Um, Rajiv's probably tired of seeing that picture of his face on every single thing that goes by. Um, I did want to leave that, um, leave this first annotation here as a guidepost to let other people know why there were so many annotations on this post and, and what was going on. Another thing I just want to draw your attention to is um, this little box I had open up here that I got to by opening this, um, this icon here of the, the little kind of um, share icon. And you'll notice that it brings up this little box that has a link in it that we can then use. And I'll go put this in chat right now. We can then use to share with anybody. You can put this in an email. You could put this in chat in the Zoom. You could put this in a social media post. And what this does is this leads to Jen's post, but with the hypothesis sidebar already enabled and open. And so that's even if folks don't already have hypothesis, you don't need hypothesis to read other people's annotations. You don't need to have an account, right? If you just want to share a document that has been annotated in a way that people can look at it, um, this, this link is what can lead you there. And that link exists not only in the context of the whole page, which is the one I just shared, but also each individual annotation uh, has that as well. So if I wanted to give people a link directly to this annotation that I made um, with this picture of Rajiv in it, I could do that as well. Um, and so I just wanna make sure that folks know that there are ways to kind of share out direct links to the text with the annotation enabled. Another thing I wanna draw your attention to, and sorry to delve into the mechanics before we get started on the meat of it here, is you'll see this little red icon up at the top of that that's red with an arrow pointing down inside a circle. What that means is that since I've loaded this page, more annotations have been made on it. We can't um, dynamically just pop them onto the page due to the way the web works, but we can let you know that there are new ones available. So I can click this uh, button and then the, that shows that a whole bunch of annotations have been made since the last time I, I refreshed the page. And so you can see that you know other folks have now, like Brenna here has, has gotten you know started on annotating um, and that, and that annotation may be in the context of, you know, making your own top level annotation like uh, Jillian did here um, <clears throat> uh, on this piece of text. Or it could be that folks are already starting to reply to some of the existing annotations, right? Like uh, in this conversation, someone has already started to reply to a annotation that I made to start things off. Um, there are other uh, other little um, you know nuances to the hypothesis interface that we can bring up as we go along. If people have questions, put them in chat. Um, and <clears throat> I appreciate Rajiv, you're saying that it's not a steep learning curve. I know it makes it seem like it is now as I'm going through the details, right? 
really it is, it can be pretty easy to get started annotating. And so all you need to do to annotate, right, is once you've got that sidebar enabled, is highlight something and that will pop up a little um, uh, interface that will either enable you to start an annotation or just make a, a highlight. Highlights are private um, just to you if you want to highlight a document without adding a note to it. If you want to make an annotation, um, as I just did, you can choose that annotation button and then you can make a choice about whether you want that annotation to be public or just private to yourself. So if you want to make private notes, you always have that capability. And then I'll just say one last sort of mechanical thing before we get started on the actual text. And that is that um, there's a difference here between the annotation that we're doing today in the public on top of this text or privately, um, or the annotation that might happen in the context of a private group that might be inside a learning management system or not. There's private groups outside of learning management systems too. But what we're doing here today is public annotation. And so um, be aware of that. If you don't want to make a public annotation, um, we'd have to like completely shift gears and move to a private group, which we're not set up to do today. You can make private annotations that are really only private to you at any time. And so, so you can go for that. So is there any um, thing, Rajiv, that you wanted to make sure people understood about the interface before we actually dive into the meat of the text too? Um, just to say, you know, start easy. I would always recommend when I'm working, you know, working with students, just, you know, whatever comes naturally, use text. But over time, I'm sure you'll start to appreciate the ability to add hyperlinks, uh, you know, other uh, images, tags, all of all of those kinds of things, but also the ability to to um, edit uh, a previous annotation. So um, for me, you know, being able to to look at it on the page is one thing, and then also going to, once you have a, your hypothesis account, going to that central landing page. So you actually had a snapshot have all of your annotations at a glance, no matter where on the web they are, uh, makes it really easy. Um, so no, I would just say, you know, it's one of those things, you, you begin you begin annotating and you stumble into uh, more, no, more nuanced ways of using it, but um, easiest way to get going is just to, is just to begin and learn from, learn from your, learn from your fumbling, fumbling around. <laughs> exactly, I mean, there's so much to learn in, um, in just experimenting, right? And, and seeing where that leads you. So I see we've, we've already got now, you know, when I first came today, there were 10 annotations on the page. Now there are 16 probably um, and a bunch of replies as well. And so I just wanted to um, uh, point out a little bit about my experience in, in starting to read this post and, and annotate it as a way to maybe um, think about how um, <clears throat> you folks get started. You know, this is, it's not an incredibly long post, but it's an incredibly rich post, be, partially because Jen has so many links out from this post, right? So this post already sits at a kind of, it's the nexus of a web of information, right? Because she's got so many different links out here. For instance, this, I centered in on this link that she had made to another post by someone who I think is maybe another one of your colleagues, Rajiv um, Jessica Zeller. Uh, and so <clears throat> one of the things is that, you know, obviously uh, when Jen provided that link, it led over, oh, Jessica, actually, I'm not sure if she's one of your colleagues. Um, I may have jumped the, uh, jumped, oh yeah, she's at TCU, got it. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, Jen provided that link, but you'll notice that um, that didn't necessarily bring us to a view of, uh, <clears throat> of this post with the sidebar already enabled and so forth. And so one of the things that I did in my link was I added a link that brought you to that other post with the sidebar enabled. And so that's another thing that you can do is sort of um, annotate things in a way that enables annotation on other web pages. And so then you can start to build a sort of web of annotation on top of other texts. It gets really complicated and deep <coughs> in some ways, but it's also just, you've got the simple ability to make annotations that include links as Rajiv mentioned. And so I think one of the things that I was doing as I went through this post is I was thinking about, oh, Jen made me think about something. Why don't I realize that in the text for other people by making an annotation at the moment in the text that Jen made me think about that and then provide a link to that other thing that it made me think about. And so I think that's just sort of one of the basic moves that we can use annotation to do is as you're reading, things are occurring in your mind, right? <laughs> you're having thoughts, hopefully. It isn't just as 
um, as Gardner Campbell would say, or one of his students would say, the text isn't just massaging your eyeballs, right? It's making your brain do things. And as your brain does things, annotation can be a way for you to leave a little trail of your thoughts and ideas as you walk through the document. And so what I did was, as I was walking through it and reading it and letting it massage my eyeballs and trigger my brain to do things, I just started to leave little uh, breadcrumb trails of, of what my thinking was at that particular moment in the text. And so like in this first one, um, the first annotation that I made on the text was when Jen brought up um, uh, all the things that were happening at Quantlin that had sort of been addressing some of the, you know, the complex background of stuff that's been going on in this in this pandemic time. And it sounds like you guys have done a lot of work in various areas um, on this at Quantlin. And so I was thinking about this would be a great place for other people to start to link to things that were happening at their institutions that were also addressing the set of concerns. And so one thing that I would invite everyone else to do now is, um, and I'm gonna ask Rajiv to talk a little bit about some of these initiatives, but if you have initiatives going on at your institution that are also addressing you know, issues of um, that we've that like historical, and ongoing injustices, the glowing climate emergency, um, you know, just teaching during the pandemic, all these things that are happening, teaching and learning, right, in that liminal space during the pandemic, um, that, you know, you could just provide links to them. You could reply to my annotation or you could add your own annotation um, as, a, as a way to get started. And so, Rajiv, I'll stop there because I've been prattling on for a while and ask you to maybe talk a little bit about what's been happening here at Kwantlen that you know Jenna's referencing here with all these different initiatives that are that are addressing these kind of emergencies and injustices and complexities. Oh my goodness, I don't think KPU is alone over here. Um, I think over the last year and a half, it's been trauma piled upon trauma piled upon trauma, right? And and part of this is, uh, you know, dealing with and and more and more people. Um, being able to look at with with just um, with a, a wee bit less of, of sort of self deception or denial, the the the, um, uh, the historical but also the ongoing violence against Indigenous peoples in Canada, uh, it's been a, a, a very very painful exercise for many Canadians who have you know worked hard to protect themselves from the reality of the genocide of the Indigenous peoples um, in 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 certainly in Canada and beyond. Um, so we have certainly, you know, um, uh, initiatives related to indigenization. There's a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, we have a new member of our team, for example, even in, even, even in the commons, uh, who's helping us to advance uh, work in the indigenization in terms of teaching and learning and, and the curriculum. Um, we have, you know, elders and residents and, and, and special advisors to the provost um, but all of this is sort of happening at the same time as work uh, on, on task forces or about anti-racism. Jen and I both sit on that committee. And, and, and then, of course, dealing with broader backdrops. I mean, I know I'm thinking of our colleagues at TRU down the road, for example. Um, it's not just the trauma of, of violence against Indigenous peoples and the ongoing um, racism uh, in, in, in our environment. But also, you know, physically, the world has been on fire in terms of wildfires throughout the province. Uh, and so that climate emergency is very real. It, it, it's very, it's not abstract at all for us. Um, so I think a lot of this has been, you know, how much trauma can we address at the same time, even if we were not dealing with uh, anything but, the, but remote instruction during a pandemic, this would be stressful enough. Uh, and so I think I appreciate Jen referring to a lot of these things because we're trying to build, we're trying to care, we're trying to care for others, educators, so that they can care for their students. But we're doing this, uh, you know, at a time of a severely diminished um, emotional bandwidth, and especially when um, uh, BIPOC faculty and staff are having to engage in that much extra emotional labor uh, on top of of everything else that's that's being demanded of them um, to caretake and, and um, try to, uh, you know, um, provide basic explanations and, and do the work that, that uh, those who are not indig Indigenous, for example, still refuse to do for themselves. So 
I appreciate where Jen is coming from over here. Uh, I, and I certainly don't think, nor do I hope that KP was alone in grappling with these. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I, I noticed, you know, you got, there are so many great things that happen in BC. I, I often think of your province up there as, you know, like the model of what, um, you know, what really uh, effective kind of public supportive education can look like, <laughs> the stuff that you guys do, the stuff that BC campus does and so forth. And I noticed that, um, Jones here, uh, who works at a community college in the United States, brought up that you know at at at, at their um, institution, um, you know it's in a completely different position, where um, they're actually you know streamlining their you know what's happening institutionally um, there, and I think that that is a real reflection of the different kind of place that public ed public education is finding itself in a place like British Columbia versus in a place like Michigan right now. Um, maybe the United States will start to shift to a different <laughs> tactic soon, but I think that this is one way that we can really cut across those boundaries, right? And start to explore the differences is by centering in on a text like this and then having people from different backgrounds and positions start to illustrate how things are different in their different environments. Um, you know, you guys are so much further ahead, I would say, than we are in the United States at starting to address some of these, um, some of these issues, especially around the injustices uh, with ind indigenous folks. Um, yeah, and, and thanks, Nate, for, for suggesting that. I, I will say, you know, I, I think part of this is, is perhaps the perception as well. Um, one of the reasons why, you know, folks like Brenna and, and us at KPU connect so much is because we find our community, we find the voices that are clamoring for the same thing. And I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, paint such a rosy picture of BC either. I mean, we're dealing with, you know, really, really deep challenges, whether we're talking about food insecurity among students at our campuses or, or, or certainly um, the sort of, continual efforts that are fairly cosmetic to address issues and 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 sweep things under the carpet and and so it is there's a lot of work to do certainly in bc um but i do think one of the benefits of this is if you're in a position where even if it's for one of these issues um you are in a position to 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 to, to try to to demonstrate what's possible uh to make it easier for others uh even if only they can point to what's possible at an institution that's similar you should do so um, so I think, yeah, we have strength in community, but we certainly have a long way before uh, I would regard the post-secondary community and particularly the student experience as as equitable and inclusive in the way that it ought to be. Yeah, and thanks for, <laughs> for drawing a finer point on that. It's just that I guess from the United States point of view or my experience, it really seems like y'all are quite a bit further ahead in at least recognizing and acknowledging the issue, um, which here is, is sometimes still buried under all the layers of streamlining. Um, uh, I um, I noticed that a couple of folks in the chat are, you know, having a discussion about um, the different ways that, um, you know, a teacher might um, kind of bring a text like this forward with a group uh, by highlighting certain areas or seeding the text with annotation or prompts beforehand. And I admit that, you know, I was doing that a little bit here um, where I went in and was one of the first people, I think I was the first person to annotate this text using hypothesis, at least publicly. And I was thinking about how I could maybe seed it with um, some annotations that ask some questions that maybe some people might, that might resonate with some people they could follow up on. And I'm wondering, Rajiv, if you find that in your practice, do you, uh, do you find yourself um, annotating texts in advance with the idea that they might help give people landing places in the text? Or do you like it to kind of more leave it more open and enable people to engage sort of wherever their, their reading takes them? I think it depends. I've seen people use the you know uh, initial annotations as, as almost a stem in a discussion forum effectively as a prompt. Uh, but what I find more helpful is to provide a few annotations that that approach annotation in, in a very different way. So it's almost uh, providing a bit of an illustration of the range of possibilities. Um, I know with students, for example, sometimes it was about, you know, augmenting the example in the text with an example from their own life to, to, to enrich that understanding for, for future students. I mean, obviously, when I teach psychology, that makes that's fairly easy to do in many cases. Uh, or otherwise, it was linking to external resources or something else. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's easy to do, but I find it more helpful to have a range of different approaches so that, um, you know, learners or, or those who are annotating have um, an idea of not just, not just this kind of pigeonholing, it's not just a discussion forum. Yeah, I, I love that that point too. It's not just a discussion forum. We've, you know, Jeremy uh, has been so often, uh, my colleague here, Jeremy Dean, has been so often brought up the point that <clears throat> that uh, you know many of the weaknesses of the discussion forum that we see in in especially learning management systems uh, can kind of annotation can help solve some of those, right? And the first most obvious one, right, is that with a discussion forum is removed from the text itself. Whereas the social annotation sits on top of the text and it can be anchored in the text. And so you don't have to do that complicated dance in the discussion forum where you have to explain what it is that you're talking about, right? Like, oh, the third paragraph where they say blah, blah, blah. Um, and then here you can just kind of root the annotation right, right in that moment itself. So that's one way. But I, I'm interested in what you were saying, Rajiv, about how um, the kind of um, conversations that can happen can be different than the kinds of conversations that often happen in discussion forums. And I'm wondering if maybe you could expand on that a little bit more. Like, what do you see, a, a, what kinds of differences do you mean when you're talking about those kinds, the, you know, discussion forum versus annotation? Uh, I, I maybe, I mean, part of this is the space where it's taking place, right? Because you are not just responding to the stem, you're also responding to the main text. And so um, I think it's easier, it, it's less forced, it's less sort of pigeonholed in that way. But but for me, one of the more obvious ways in which this is really different is the is the um, sort of temporal collaboration, right? It's not just one discrete group of learners, right? Um, especially if you leave the, the sort of behavioral residue of the intellectual work of, of previous cohorts in the space, um, you can have that that pollination um, from one cohort to the next, from one year to the next, um, and so you don't actually you, you really are building cumulatively on on the intellectual work that's taking place. It's not just the usual discussion forum in the LMS. You know, um, write one post, respond to two, uh, end of the semester, rinse and repeat, scrub the learning management system as though the student's intellectual property didn't have any value. It, it just it allows for that that you know, ongoing cumulative iterative scholarship that that values um, student work and, and of course allows them to, 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 to provide a foundation for, for further learning down the line. And that's maybe an interesting segue to, to touch on a big part of your other work that I, that I know you even more deeply from um, when you mentioned, you know, um, valuing student intellectual property and activity. And uh, if we just kind of, I noticed it was coming up in the chat too about the ways that annotation could be um, parts of maybe um, you know open educational resources and so forth. And so if we think about open education broadly and that idea that you know teachers and learners are all you know co-participants in generating knowledge, um, I and I know that this is a deep part of your work, Rajiv. And and then I noticed that also rooted in Jen's text is this moment where she says, um, I discovered that open pedagogy, universal design for learning and appreciative inquiry all promote offering information in different and sometimes multimodal ways, providing assignment options so that students can share knowledge in ways that are meaningful to them and encourage self-reflection. And um, I centered in on that little, that little moment too, just because a lot of my work has been in open education, just thinking about it. And I'm wondering if, um, that what the connection that you make between social annotation, which isn't necessarily an, an open educational practice, but it can be, and then the connections you make to open educational practices that you've been involved in. Yeah, I mean, I think there's very direct applications to be sure. I mean, you know, our friend Robin DeRosa, you know, pioneered some of this back when she was you know, working with her students to curate an open anthology of early American literature. And the students had what, more than 10,000 annotations in a single semester. I mean, it was a terrific example of, also a fairly low barrier entry into open educational practices with students, right? Uh, we do have students all the time at KPU working with their faculty members to, to create uh, new open educational resources, including open textbooks. But annotating an open text is, is a really, really uh, easy way to begin, particularly when you think about the expertise that students have um, 
they're, they are, you know, the experts in terms of what are the bottleneck concepts? What are we struggling to understand over here? How did you manage to find your way past this? Um, and they're in obviously in an ideal position to pass those notes on to future cohorts of students. And so whether it's, and sometimes people do this as a separate guidebook, handbook for, you know, first year seminar students is something Robin worked on as well. Um, but, you know, so much of the learning is in this, these sort of liminal in between, or in this case, marginal spaces, um, that I think just availing of that. Um, now, of course, part of this is very much student agency, right? And, and, and I know we've talked about this quite a bit already in the past, about um, if you have students engaging in open pedagogy, for example, uh, but for example, they are not given a choice about whether or not they engage in public scholarship or whether or not they openly license their work, then of course, this is more exploitation than innovation in pedagogy. Um, and so it is, I think, a useful spot to have that discussion. Um, so at KPU, for example, our intellectual property policy um, confirms or affirms, reifies that uh, students own the IP for their own uh, uh, own coursework, for example. So, um, so we have this wonderful template we've develop, developed, which is openly licensed, and so I'm happy to share it. Um, that allows uh, that that allows students to have a, a an informed conversation and and make some informed choices about whether or not they want to openly license their work and and what license they wish to apply. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's there's just a whole lot that you can do if you decenter um, yourself as a as as the expert uh, with students in the classroom. Um, particularly now, uh, you think about the majority of students in higher education in North America are not so-called traditional students, right? Traditional students are not traditional students. Uh, typical students are non-traditional. So what does traditional even mean? Um, and so there's such a rich you know, um, tapestry of life experiences, knowledges, cultural knowledges, uh, uh, you know, indigenous perspectives that are not within often the instructor. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in many ways, pretending that that uh, that the instructor is only uh, is the only source of, of knowledge or wisdom in, in the room is is a, a, a very, very dramatic disservice uh, to students and, and certainly uh, uh, the sort of hubris that they that extended Odysseus's journey. I love that you're everything that you said right there, because, you know, the, the hubris of is the thing that I feel like most needs to be kind of um, uh, filtered out of all, all the kinds of practices that we have, the hubris of the institution, the hubris of the teacher. Um, and so much of your work has, has addressed that. Um, you can see uh, in the background, I was struggling to Google and find uh, the open anthology uh, work that I that you were mentioning. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I couldn't actually find it, so that shows how uh, how bad my Google skills are. If somebody else in the crowd has a handy link to the to the work that um, Rajiv was talking about, love it if you'd post that in the chat. Um, you know, and Peter brings up a, a kind of related question about this. He says, "All public hypothesis comments are CC licensed, correct?" And so that's um, we could talk about that for a second. You'll notice um, if you look at um, <clears throat> When you actually sign up and make your account and, and you're posting in the public in the public uh, sort of channel, if you will, of hypothesis that um, in, the, in the terms of service, we also mentioned that um, your comments are actually they're not licensed. They're actually um, declared to be in the public domain, which is a, a, a nuance of, <laughs> of uh, open licensing. Right. Open licenses are uh, where you still retain the copyright to something. And you, but you li openly license it for other works with various um, kind of nuances, like it might you know, require attribution or non-commercial use or no derivatives or something. Um, moving something into the public domain directly is is um, a little bit different than a license. It's basically saying I, as the copyright holder, release this work into the public domain immediately instead of waiting until whatever the right uh, timing is after your death in different different legal areas. And there's a reason why Hypothesis made the choice to have all public annotations be in the public domain. And that is that um, it's almost impossible to know where those public annotations are going to surface in other ways. And so um, there's no there's no way that we can guarantee or uh, police <laughs> any kind of you know copyright infringement around that. And so what we wanted to make clear is that in the public channel, uh, annotations are fully public, even to the point of being in the public domain. 
Now, that's not true of your private annotations. It's not true of your annotations in private groups. It's not true of your annotations with students in private groups or in private groups in the learning management system, because in those cases, right, um, there is control around who can see and view annotations. So there, to kind of a long-winded answer to your, to your question there, um, Peter, but yes, uh, annotations in the public layer are, um, uh, you are saying as the author that you're willing to release them into the public domain when you make them. Um, so uh, <clears throat> there is that sort of nuance to it. Um, and that's why annotating in the public uh, channel is a little bit different than annotating in all the other channels. And I know that uh, several other educators, uh, not unlike Rajiv, think about um, working with students or other groups who are annotating in a kind of scaffolded experience where maybe you you start out by annotating in one mode or in one space and then build toward another. And I see Rajiv nodding. And so I'll, I'll let you maybe speak to that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's part of the conversation, right? Is, is making sure there is, with all kind of open practices, there is risk and, and that risk is not evenly distributed. And so you do have the, the obligation to have that conversation, the duty to have that conversation with students and to make sure you're not in, uh, placing them in peril in, in any way. Um, you know, whether it's the sort of verbal abuse that marginalized students are more likely to get in Wikipedia assignments or anything else. Um, and so, yeah, in the past, uh, I know my students, some have chosen and, and felt more comfortable annotating in a private group we set up for the course, where it's only the, the students in, enrolled in the class can see those, those annotations and myself. Uh, but in other cases, they, they, they choose to, to make those annotations publicly, knowing that, yes, future cohorts, yes, the, the public, if we're talking about a, a public web page, will be able to view those as well. But I do think it's essential that that um, that is an informed conversation. And so I think this also kind of... Um, perhaps illustrates the importance of that basic um, information and data literacy that really ought to be a foundational element of, of post-secondary education anyway, uh, but hopefully uh, you know, it'll be a good thing for them to get it in, in your course. Yeah, and I think I know Dan mentioned too that he, in the chat, that he's moved away from annotating in the public, you know, precisely around, you know, intellectual property concerns for students and so forth, privacy concerns. And all these things have to be weighted balanced, right? Like there is a, there is a place for uh, working with students to actually, you know, become inter public scholarly discourse, right? In a, in a thoughtful, you know, fully informed structured way. And then there are other times when, you know, annotation needs to happen or can more fruitfully happen in a, in a more private, you know, sheltered space. And I think the fact that both of those are possible is one of the um, is one of the the flexibilities that that makes hypothesis um, sort of powerful. Now it does mean there's extra complexity there that you know is up to you to negotiate. But the way I think about it is that it's a moment for dig <laughs> digital literacy, right? To think about digital digital literacy skills. Um, in you know rather than trying to protect your students from this or enable them to do that. Instead, it's a moment to have a conversation with them about what those different modes are about and, and what they're like. Um, <clears throat> uh, you, you know, I noticed that we're, we're running up uh, close to, uh, we got, you know, we definitely have some time left, but we're, we're scheduled to end at 1130 Pacific time here. And Rajiv, I just wanted to also give you a chance to say, you know, you're giving this keynote next week. Um, you've had this experience with us here today. There's been a whole bunch of conversation on top of this text. We've had a conversation here uh, in, the, in the workshop itself. Is there anything else that you wanted people to be thinking about um, in, in the context of what you're going to be saying when you actually deliver the keynote? Oh, gosh, it's a good question. I mean, I think like most people I've been, you know, uh, running, uh, chasing my tail. So with very, not as much time to think about things uh, as I would like. But, you know, I would say one of the one of the things that I find very powerful about about digital annotation in the first place is is just how it allows you to, to have a voice it, that you don't need to have the platform to have your voice be heard and seen and, and for people to build on it. Um, and so for me, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to the conversation. I'm trying to build on the work of a lot of, a lot of people, um, but whether it's the, 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 the conversation on Twitter during or after the annotations um, over here, uh, I just hope we can, we can you know, sort of draw on, on, that, on that shared knowledge um, 
and, and sort of wheel that that this of the, the whole I think that there's a spirit that's lurking beneath this uh, in terms of um, uh, inviting uh, marginal voices to have uh, you know, providing a way for the for voices that have traditionally been marginalized, uh, whether it's students in a classroom or, for example, um, you know, uh, BIPOC uh, faculty or staff uh, to, to have their voice carry. Um, and especially to, to, to critique and build on what, what, um, what the platform is actually saying. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm really looking forward to all of you um, building on what I will be able to share um, and just taking our understanding far, far further, further than, than I would be able to. Uh, and just in terms of Jen's uh, post itself, I think this is a really good example. Jen is the instructor I aspire to be, right? So, um, uh, I, I hope that you also just discover more of her work, um, uh, and in turn that that yeah, I mean, we continue this 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 work of community building. It's it's great to be working with people who <laughs> you aspire to be. Um, that seems like the best possible team situation. Um, <clears throat> I uh, I know that um, it's probably it's probably true, right, Rajiv, that. One needs to be a registered OLC Accelerate uh, participant in order to actually attend your keynote. Is that right? Um, that is my understanding. It's been an interesting journey, I should say, first of all. And, and you know, one of the awkward things is this is a keynote I was supposed to give a year and a half ago. Um, and then, of course, uh, the on-site keynote was, was scuppered because the event had to change in the wake of the pandemic. And then I was supposed to do this six months ago or five, six months ago. Um, and OLC allowed me to, to work uh, around it because I was uncomfortable with uh, one of the sponsors of, of, that, of that keynote being um, a kind of a tech company that was antithetical to the, to the values that I was trying to, 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 to speak to. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, you know, I think um, it, it, I, my understanding is that it, 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 the recording will probably be available for a year for those who are registered, who are attending the conference. But I will say that you know, there's so much of what I'm planning to share that I will be writing up and posting on my blog as well, at least in text. And so perhaps as a, as a forecasting the invitation to, to annotate uh, at least uh, the basis of that um, in, in the weeks and months to come. Great, thanks for sharing. I know it's a, it's a complex dance with all these different spaces, right, about what's happening. Um, and uh, I will, I can say that um, if you, uh, Rajiv, want to share anything that you do that, um, you know, uh, ties into this in the future, I'd be happy to email all the registrants for this workshop with that information if you want to make sure that they uh, are connected to it again. And obviously, we can do things like annotate Jen's document with a link to <laughs> this next thing or whatever it is. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we can make those connections. I wanted to actually circle back to something you were saying, Rajiv, about how uh, you find social annotation providing a space for, you know, historically marginalized voices to maybe um, layer on top of other works and texts and have their voices kind of be to to kind of appear there, and that makes me think again of the way that um, social annotation can serve as a kind of um, you know, layering of of new texts on top of old uh, in a, in a kind of way that can turn that original text into what I think of as a three dimensional kind of experience, right? So there's the flat two dimensional experience of the original text, but then the annotations provide a new layer that adds, um, you know, both a time perspective and a, a different place positionality perspective to that original text. That can be read alongside it, and um, I just I I often think about how it's uh, it can become an incredibly powerful tool for other to for other voices to be involved in that three dimensionality of making the original text three dimensional. Um, and so I think about what we've been doing here today as taking Jen's original text and adding, you know, other dimensions to it. Um, and I'll just stress again that um, we can continue to annotate on top of this text forever, right? Or at least as long as it's available on the web. There's no reason why we have to stop doing it just because we leave this experience today. And so I'm wondering, um, 
Rajiv, if you're thinking about um, the the work that you might do that you said was going to come out of your your keynote address, uh, is that uh, when you're thinking about that, is that mostly in the form of writing that you might do, or is it um, uh, classes that you might be teaching, or how how do you see that work playing out? Well, certainly sharing. I mean, I'm still writing away, but uh, I imagine I'll be, you know, releasing sort of sections of, of that keynote on, on uh, as posts on the blog, especially when it's a, a particular you know, train of thought. Um, but absolutely, I mean, you know, there's, there's um, it, will, it will certainly infuse our thought. Um, and I'm just trying to think about, you know, the work that we do, building systems, um, advocating within our institution and then and then kind of leveraging that to advocate within the sector to push the sector towards uh, more inclusive ethical practices is, is a good thing. Um, we've certainly done that in a couple of cases already. Um, so for me, I think it's just, yes, I will be releasing portions of the text uh, that I can uh, moving forward, um, but hopefully just being able to translate that into practice within our institution in a way that can assist um, the sector as, as higher education as a whole. And I just I just shared out your website and blog in the chat. I'll be showing it on the screen there too. I assume that that's a really good place for people to stay current with what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome. And you know, hypothesis is activated on the site, and I, I look forward to having that conversation. But you know, one of the awkward things over here is is you know, for for whatever reason. Um, Monday's keynote is a is a platform that uh, that I've been invited to, and and whenever you have a platform like that, obviously you have a you should be thinking deeply about the responsibility of that platform and and how you want to use it and for what purpose you want to use it because part of this is reminding me about you know tables and and when you talk about who has access to the keynote and all of this, it's sort of I know our friend Mahabali's talked about this as well where you know sometimes. You don't want to wait to, to be invited to, to join a particular table. You want to set up your own table, and um, and so whether you're whether you're attending OLC or not, um, I really hope that that you know you share your ideas, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's annotating on on my blog. But um, yeah, I mean, I I just hope that 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 you can use every channel to to build on it, uh, build on this, and share your own thoughts about um, how much further we can go. Um, yeah, yeah so that... I'll leave it there. And I will just say that um, one of the things that's been good about our collaboration with OLC here is that we have always sort of insisted, like, we want to do this workshops in conjunction with the conference, but we want them to be a more fully open experience. And so we think of this as a chance for the keynoter, in, in this case, you, and, and you, and the themes that you're thinking about, the ideas that you're thinking about to be surfaced to a different table, right, with different chairs sitting around it. So we really appreciate that you were able to do that and, and OLC is willing to make that happen too. I can't help but notice that hanging behind you on the wall, it looks like there might be a balalaika. Is that a balalaika and a guitar and maybe a oh, they're couple. They're all ukuleles. Oh, they're, they're all ukuleles. Okay, sorry. Uh, I uh, I thought maybe the, the red and white one was a balalaika just from its shape, but I'm wondering, <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but could you talk a little bit about um, what your relationship with those instruments is? Oh God, yeah. Uh, so I mean, I love I love ukuleles. I discovered them a few years ago, and and you know, at some point maybe I'll graduate to six strings, but four is what I can manage for now. But you know, it just reminded me so much of of uh, just so joy. You know, my, my background is in the performing arts anyway. But um, you know, if you've ever been in a room with twenty five other people who are strumming um, on on ukuleles at the same time, you know what joy is. Uh, I mean, it's just it's a fairly easy instrument to play. My children are learning how to play them as well. Um, and so for me, it, it just helps me to think half the time. So um, uh, I'm trying to think the that one that you're referring to is from the Magic Fluke Company, which is in Massachusetts, I believe. Um, nice it's very cool. Yeah. Uh, and then this one over here, uh, Fender released some electric ukuleles. And so you get wildly different variations on the same instrument. But but yeah, you know, it's just simple, musical. Um, and and yeah, I suppose I, I could always play, but yeah. um, I was actually going to uh, ask you if Fanny beat me to it. I was wondering if you, I didn't want to put you on the spot again, but I was wondering <laughs> if you would like to do a little song for us. Well, you know, but I think, you know, part of what, what, what you're, you know, even when you make a request like this, it's, this is open education in, in a way, right? Because you're often, 
you have to think about the vulnerability of that and, and not worrying about it being the perfect finished article before you place yourself in a place of sharing. And if you think about you know, higher education as a whole, why is it that we are worried about sharing our instructional practice with our colleagues? I, sometimes we're afraid of being found out. Other times we're afraid of that our secret source will be stolen. And, and, and a lot of that fear, a lot of that vulnerability is also beyond the, the issue of, of annotation. You know, do I want to keep my insights to myself? Am I not sure? Is this right? Should I tweet this? Should I blog this? It's not perfect yet. Um, but the, you know, release early, release often, there is that vulnerability that's involved over here. And so certainly I'll play. I haven't played um, in certainly the last couple of play. weeks. <laughs> but no, I don't mind. Um, we would but I would it. just, in, you know, I, I, more than playing, I would say this is just about, you know, the importance of, of modeling vulnerability and not worrying too much about um, uh, whether it's the finished article or not. Can you hear this at all? Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely heard a little sound coming out there. Try another strum. It's a little, it's a little, um, it's a little uh, distant sounding maybe because of, you know, you, you're using your headphones. Yeah, sorry. No, but I think if you sang a little bit along with it too, we would definitely be able to hear it. Well, see, I think this is one of the things we've also talked about um, is for some reason, the open education community at so many of our conferences, we do these karaoke events, right? And and I have often wondered, and I know Tom is in the room as well, um, that I, I feel like there's a connection over here because there's a willingness to be vulnerable. Um, but of course, there's also community building that happens with, with music and song. But yeah, so for me, this is, you know, perhaps it's scaffolding with an accessible way to begin with just four strings. Uh, and what do they say in country music? You need three chords and the truth, right, to, to sing. Um, uh, and so, you know, it's accessible, it builds community, it, it allows you to demonstrate vulnerability. So I certainly recommend you pick up one of these, uh, one of these, uh, one of these fabulous instruments. Um, there's some really, really good um, instructors on, on the open web as well. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I certainly encourage you to to play with them. It's super easy. I, I love that idea of the three chords and the truth. Um, can you give us a little uh, three chords and the truth? Would you be willing to, to <laughs> take us to the yeah. end with that? Yeah, I'm not sure I'll be able to do that. Actually, now that I'm hearing it, one of the one of the strings is out of key. Oh, so I okay. Have to pull yeah. another one. That's but, right. um, but yeah, I mean, um, this is the one that's usually in my office, but I had to bring it home. But this also feels really um, like a really bizarrely um, self-focused way of, of ending the session when I would much rather that we parley our efforts into, into serving folks. Um, well, I, but, but I think what you know, you're doing, what you're doing about the modeling of vulnerability um, and demonstrating this kind of multimodal community building, like all those things, like I know I, it seems self-serving, but a lot of folks did actually come here because they um, love to hear your voice. And so I think hear it in another way would be really valuable. Well, that's sweet. But I will say, um, you know, it's been a thrill to, to spend time with you all this morning. Um, I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's such an interesting time, such an interesting juncture to be able to, to speak to the directions and currents in higher education, especially as we're looking at the trauma of the last 18 months. And now, you know, I know in, in BC, in many ways, many folks are, we're expecting to be back on campus and that we're pivoting away back from the pivot back to campus. Um, it seems like, you know, the, the, the trauma and challenge is not ending. And so, you know, I do think more than anything, this is the importance of having community and, and being able to draw strength from each other's, um, um, yeah, from each other's work is critical because, Lord knows we, you know, we have such a long way to go, and and um, you know, higher education in many ways has has some of the best people I have ever encountered. Yes, it has some of the worst people I've ever encountered as well, but there's there's a lot of hope, um, and I think the the critical importance of education becomes more true every day. Um, so perhaps I'll I'll just hope that that um, if I can if I can say this in closing, um, that I just wish that you and, and your family members, your loved ones, your communities can stay safe, can stay healthy as we as we navigate the, the, the next phase of, of whatever this ongoing uh, crisis um, uh, continues to look like. But, uh, you know, know that you, you have 
uh, like-minded people. And, and especially if you're at a place, a context, an institution where you feel like you're the only voice that's pushing for a more human-centered approach to education, you're not alone. And so for me, perhaps the, the, the long game over here is culture change, not just within the institution, but within the sector. Um, and so the more vocal I think we can be about it from platforms like that one on Monday, the, the more we can um, make that a reality. So anyway. It's a little bit of, leave it uh, th thank you for those words, taking us out. We'll, we'll use that as our goodbye and whatever you're gonna play. Um, and it, maybe it's a little bit like um, deciding which dress you're gonna wear to the Met Gala, right? <laughs> <laughs> so here's your dress. I hear you, Trisha. I'm still not singing, but I appreciate you all being here. Have a lovely day, everyone. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much, Rajiv. And with that, we'll bring it to a close. Thanks, everybody, for coming.